I think America is probably one of the worst places one can be born in if you're black and and a woman. Myself and two other very nerdy friends <laughs> went to would in like the December holidays go to the constitutional court to go hear cases. Some at so many levels. South Africans can perform and compete and be better. The constitution is an empty shell in the absence of action. You often find judges almost forced in cases to be activists in their role beyond what we imagine judges to be able to do. Na, 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 na. Spread the fire everyone. Welcome to SMWX. Um, today I'm joined by a really fascinating, brilliant guest who I admire greatly. You may have seen him at the International Court of Justice where he was a member of the legal team. And ever since then, his rates have gone very high if you want his services, <laughs> just to let you know. <laughs> Advocate Tsiriso Ramokhale, thank you and welcome to SMWX. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Yesterday's yeah. price is not today's price. As Jay-Z said. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so great to have you with us. Of course, you know, I think the, the nation became aware of your brilliance, although many of us knew about it uh, before when you were at the ICJ. And today I just want to take a step, a journey through your, your legal journey, culminating in the ICJ, which we'll get to. But I suppose what I'm really interested to start off with is, um, what was the moment when you realized that you, you wanted to be a lawyer? And what was the moment that you realized that you wanted to become an advocate within mm. the legal profession? Mm. Uh, thank you. Um... It was probably, you know, my, my family, I think it's a story that's now sort of well told, uh, was subject to an eviction. I was probably 13, 14 at the time. Hmm. Um, I think I was in grade, whatever age it, it is, at like grade seven or eight hmm. uh, around hmm. that time. But it was just the injustice that followed the system. The the idea that you you can have a home today and then it's sold the next day, and then you're told to leave and you're kicked out. Mm -hmm. And just the helplessness at that time. I remember my mother scrambling, moving from pillar to post, trying to sort all of this out. Um, it just felt deeply wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I so that's the first. The second was I was always in debating society and public speaking at school. And uh, my aunt had always said that I, you know, have a hot head and refuse to, when I've got a bone of contention, I refuse to let it go until I win the point. And uh, yeah, it was just that thing where, you know, family says, you know, that's the space that you're in. School teachers would tell you, mm -hmm. you should be a lawyer, you're very argumentative. <laughs> so I sort of, that sort of stuck when I thought of courses to take up at universities, law was the first one and it made sense. Mm -hmm. And it was a gamble. Um, I didn't know whether I'd like it or not. There were no, there are no lawyers in my family. Hmm. In fact, I'm the first one to go to university in my family. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, so it was a complete gamble. Uh, there wasn't really anybody within my immediate radius that I could reach out to and say, what does this thing look like? Hmm. Um, so applied, uh, I got in, I, I only applied at WITS actually. That was also a gamble wow. because I didn't do UCT and UP that other people actually do. I only applied at WITS yeah. got in there. Why WITS only? Um, there was a thing at that time, my sister, my siblings would always, you know, the vets was, you know, I still think it is, but at the time it was vets or nothing. Mm. Um, UCT wasn't in the realm of, I wouldn't say possibility, but um, it just wasn't seen as a as important, as prestigious as uh, mm. vets was. So I, I went for that. Um, and yeah, and thankfully in first year I fell in love with law. Mm. Um, Tell and, us about that process of yeah. like thinking that you could be good at this, thinking that you could be interested. And then when you actually meet the subject yeah. and that moment where you're like, wow, yeah. the law is, is something that really resonates with me. Yeah. I think what makes it, what made that journey particularly interesting was the transition from, you know, the old apartheid system into our constitutional democracy. Mm where the, right at the beginning of the constitution there is a recognition of the injustice of the past and a commitment to do better going forward and so, so a deep sense of injustice is something that i had always been concerned about and something that that i'm deeply passionate about eradicating and so it fell quite naturally which is the reason why courses such as constitutional law mm -hmm. or uh, public interest litigation or uh, you know, legal clinics at law school were my favorite ones. Mm. And I just gobbled it up. You know, there was this big book by 
Ian Curry. It's called the Bill of Rights Handbook. Mm. I'm sure you've seen it. Oh, yes. Um, I would, it was such easy reading. Um, wow. uh, I would be two, three chapters ahead of the class mm. uh, at a time because it just felt like a natural flow. Mm. And so that's the reason why I knew that this was actually the right place. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. it just came in second nature. So it, it was that, but I remember particularly a, a story that resonated with me was a case of Gundwan. Um, um, I, I came across that in a, in a pun law class in the first year. And in Gundwana, the, um, there was a, uh, a mother who had two kids, if I recall correctly. She lived in her home for about 20 years and uh, her, soul, her house was sold in execution by NetBank. Uh, and she brought an, a case before the High Court challenging the sale of her house, but particularly because the process at that time was if there was no contestation about the sale, and there's deb debates about is there a real contestation or not, because often, and I think it's still the same way we do things today, mm. when we serve legal documents, we serve it through the sheriff's office, or you get a little slip from the post office saying you've got mail. Mm. Um, and they debate about whether that's an effective way of actually bringing to the attention of someone that something very material is about to happen mm. to them. Mm. And so similarly with Gundwana, it was that same process where she contested whether um, the case was properly brought uh, before her and, and, th and to her attention um, and went to court. And the way in which it worked at that time was that the registrar, if there was no contestation, the registrar would sign the sale of execution. That was the end of it. Right. And so Gundwana changed the law in that you know, she was unhappy with that outcome. She appealed to the Supreme Court of Appeal and ultimately get, got to the Con Court. Mm. And in the Constitutional Court, it said it was unconstitutional for a person's home to be sold in execution without a judge overseeing that. Mm. Because what 26.3 uh, of the Constitution requires is a judge to engage in that, you know, um, competing considerations and a value judgment, essentially. Right. But do I give the order? Do I not give the order? Because you're about to sell somebody's home. Mm, mm. And so the idea that it's an administrative process where mm. the registrar just signs an order and that's it, your home is gone, mm. um, just doesn't countenance with the spirit of the constitution. So Gundwana um, was very similar to what might happened to my family and mm. I. Mm. And, and, and sort of a, a promise that I had made to myself that if I ever came across all these kind of cases, that I would be the lawyer that helps out. Mm. Um, so it was important. It was both personally uh, an important goal, but uh, it's just something I was purely interested in as well. Yeah. You, you make your way through, through VITS and presumably, you know, fall deep in love with the law and come to grapple with it even even more um, extensively and then you make your way in which point of the journey do you make your way to harvard where where you know you go to one of the world's best law schools um it was so i left i finished vits i uh, then went to the constitutional court right and clerked for justice kampepe at the time i think mm. she became the acting deputy chief justice or Chief Justice, whatever the mm. title was mm. at the time. Um, and it was a great time. I think to this day, second to my job now, the best job I've had. Wow. Uh, wow. So I'd encourage... I mean, the place to be, right, if you want to... 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah, it's just the creme de la creme of cases. Um, you're working with our country's best legal minds. You get involved in the cases. So you're not doing, you know, filing work or anything of that. So you'll do that. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> and it won't be the judge. Yeah. <laughs> but you really get your teeth in and, and to do it as a young lawyer is really shaping. Mm -hmm. um, so I clerked for Justice and Pepe and, and okay. the court runs them. Yeah. No, no, I want to actually carry on with yeah. the Concord uh, clerking journey. Yeah. Yeah. So the Concord runs a, a foreign law clerks program. Right. Uh, basically, um, any clerk, any law, law student, I mean, lawyer really around the world can apply to this program. Mm. And you, in each chamber, the way in which it works is that each judge gets, is entitled to have two clerks. Um, but then when you have foreign clerks, your chamber can beef up to two, three, I mean, three, four, five, or whatever the, right. the number. Right. And so, the foreign clerkship program is, is, is that, so it attracts lawyers around the world. In that year, there was a, um, a, a Yale Law graduate, her name is Alana Kembabazi, mm. uh, who was talking in, my, in the same chambers as I was. Uh, prior to her, there was a guy called Rob Stanley. But Alana was from Uganda, um, strong African roots, strong black woman, and we were just talking about, and we became very good friends as a result of that, you know, 
just talking about like career goals and what are you going to do afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to her, you know, I've always been curious about doing a master's, I mean, I'll probably do a little bit. And she's like, mm -hmm. but why would you, you know, you've just come from this, why would you do another degree here? Mm -hmm. I said, well, where else can one go? UCT? <laughs> she said, no, you can go abroad. Mm -hmm. Like that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had not known anybody uh, in my space who had gone to a Harvard, a Yale. Alana was the first. Sure. And yeah, she was just like, you just do it. And so I then started looking into those programs. I thought, oh, wow, it actually is possible. There's a whole programs that exist. I had always imagined that US law schools are only interested in American studying there. Mm. Um, same with the English schools, etc. And so um, when Alana had literally just from that conversation completely changed my trajectory, mm. Mm. I thought Harvard was impossible. And in fact, in my the school I had aimed for first was Columbia. That was a school I thought, right. oh, you know, there's a chance I could get in. Maybe I could go there. Mm. So I applied to Columbia, applied to Berkeley, applied to Michigan, applied to UCLA, applied certainly more than my visa. Yeah. Um, where else did I apply? Quite a few. I think I applied to about six schools. Harvard was was like, oh yes, uh, there was Notre Dame. Mm. But Harvard was the last, literally the last application I made because wow. I just thought, well, I'm here already. Might as well just apply. What harm is there? Sure. And it was a school I got into. Mm -hmm. I got into, in fact, all of the schools. Oh, snap. Um, huh? <laughs> yeah. He says, just yeah. yeah. So I got into all of the schools, but um, Harvard had made, in fact, in addition to getting in, yeah. had made the most attractive uh, financial aid offer. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it was an easy choice. It was an easy choice uh, getting there. Yeah. Amazing. And um, what was it like when you got to Harvard? And what what did you learn at Harvard that you still keep with you now? Mm -hmm. Sure. The American experience was both jarring and like uh, life changing. Mm -hmm. At first, it was a a deep, 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 deep uh, disappointment in the mm -hmm. American life, American system. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think America is probably one of the worst places one can be born in if you're a black and and a woman, uh, and probably one of the worst places you can be born in if you're poor, because I found it to be a deeply uncaring society uh, <laughs> about its marginalized, about people it had discarded. So that was the one, mm -hmm. and it, you see it all over. You really, uh, a friend of mine likes to say, like, um, America is like a third world country with a Gucci belt, you know. <laughs> um, so that was the one experience I had. The other was, I, it was a place of immense privilege. And so you, you, you really traverse both worlds. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You see people who are marginalized in the one, literally, as you step out of Harvard, uh, on my first day, you see people, st streams of people lying on the sidewalk, yeah. sleeping there. Absolutely. That is their home. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you then step onto the campus and it's this beautiful, mm. you know, red brick building. When you walk into the building, there's marble all over the, you know, you, you, you can just see the wealth. Yeah. And so people often speak about, for instance, uh, you know, uh, as you fly into Cape Town and you see Kailicha on the left and then, you know, Table Mountain on the right, that disparity was similarly Alex and uh, Santon. Mm. But you see the exact same thing in the US, mm. everywhere you go, exact same thing. And it was shocking because that's not the America I had in my head. The America I had in my head was, you know, everybody's doing well, everybody's taken care of, a person got a job or two jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was shocking because it, I, you, you're, you're told when you leave South Africa, you're going into the first world, you, you go to a place where things work. Yeah. And they work, but it depends on who you are mm -hmm. and your access to privilege and money and power. And so Harvard was that. You, you it was incredible. I mean, I always make fun of the, like the silly little things that we had access to, like yeah. when it was raining and you'd want to uh, go to the library and you had your umbrella. There were umbrella bags at the door, you know, to put your umbrella in. <laughs> like, you know, to have the money to have umbrella bags. Yeah. You know what I mean? The foresight to even think like, like yeah. everyone needs their own umbrella. <laughs> yeah. You can't. You simply won't. And it's discardable, right? So tomorrow you can get another umbrella bag. You know, so it's just. Like having money to buy an umbrella bag. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And then, but just outside, people are sleeping on the streets. Yeah. You know, there's something that hits you when you go to those institutions, and maybe you've seen 
South African wealth. Mm. And, and I mean, you, you've spoken really interestingly about the, the parallels and the way that the wealth inequality mirrors South African wealth. Yeah. But there's something about when you see global wealth, yeah. you're like, oh, wow, these are the South African bosses' bosses. Yeah. <laughs> like, the Oppenheimers answer to people here. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that you'll never be the same when you see like yeah. the amount of wealth that is extracted from Africa that yeah. actually builds these institutions. Um, and and you, you finally see the inner chambers of global wealth. Yeah, yeah. Harvard, I think, is... I mean, if one had, if you had thought you had seen wealth before, mm. it is a, an extraordinary level there. Mm. But also just the sheer amount of access. I mean, you would be getting a lunchtime email saying tomorrow um, XYZ billionaire is coming to campus to talk about. And they won't say XYZ billionaire. Mm. This person is coming to campus. Mm. It's happening at this together with the other person who is also talking in the next room who yeah. also happens to be a billionaire or the CEO of XYZ is coming. Literally one on one. Um, you can't, the sheer access. I mean, in a classroom, you would be classmates with like a, a prince from uh, whichever country or this one's uh, mm. uh, mother is a senator in XYZ or this one's father is a president of XYZ. Mm. These are people who you know, these are people who you have access to. And when you, I, it blew my mind because you, know, you, you sort of see South African society and you, you know, sometimes you get invited into certain rooms, etc. Yeah. But Harvard is just at a different scale. Absolutely. And um, but also the what it does for your life, the fact that you have that kind of access mm -hmm. uh, is incredible. I mean, I uh, one of my professors was um, is married to a current city uh, senator. Him and I are good friends, and there's a you know she ran for president and was a very serious contender um, uh, for that office. If she had gotten in, I literally would have been one person yeah. away from the president of the United States. Wow. That's and that's purely from going to Harvard. Yeah. I, I did nothing yeah. magical or special or anything, yeah, but just being there and having that kind of access mm. to knowledge. Mm. It, it's mind blowing. I, I, it was one of the things that took me back uh, uh, and uh, still a, a great privilege that one has today. Yeah. How did you how did you deal with the intimidation of the institution? And, you know, just to succeed and graduate is, is a massive journey because all of this is coming at you. Mm. You know, you're, you're, you're from South Africa. Um, not from wealth, mm. and suddenly you have to compete academically with the Saudi prince. Yeah, who <laughs> <laughs> has probably like seventeen tutors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there is that moment of, can I do this? Yeah. Am I equal to the task? Yeah. Um, take us through that journey of yeah. how you, you, you found the inner confidence because that's what you need to mm. to say, I am equal to this. Yeah. You know, the first lecture you get when you get there in orientation week is about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest in saying I had never heard of it before then. <laughs> um, the idea, I was like, what is this imposter syndrome that everybody's talking about? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea, the sense that you don't particularly belong in a space. Um, I can't ever say I, I felt out of place because I... I, you know, my method was one, don't try and compete. Like you, you just won't. Hmm. And, and two, keep your head down and just like do the work hmm. and let the work speak for you. And so hmm. um, I didn't, I'll be honest and say, I didn't have to wrestle per se with myself and like be like, okay, I don't belong here. Yeah. I think once one got in and um, this is the journey that you're going to follow, you just have to show up. Hmm. And so if, if, you know, it's almost like, you know, a duck that moves gracefully in water, hmm. you're kicking and screaming underneath, but when you show up to class, you've done the readings, you're prepared, you're arguing as vigorously as anybody else in that room. And that was important because I understood what it meant being there. Hmm. And that I had, couldn't give myself room for self-doubt or to question why I was particularly there. I'm there now, make the best of it. Mm. Um, and so I, I didn't feel out of place uh, per se, but I also, because I, I think I quickly found my community of friends, um, people who also didn't come from uh, privilege and didn't come from money, but 
also somehow got there. And it made it easier because there was a community of people who, you know, you transitioned that journey through. Mm. So yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest in saying I had a good time. I mean, in classrooms as I was at Wits, yeah. it was always the guy who had his hand up <laughs> in a debate a particular topic. And I enjoyed it. I mean, I was really there. It was a year long program. Mm. I had to make the best of it. Uh, and so that was really my approach, yeah. Fast forward to the journey to the bar, um, which is the place where advocates uh, do their craft. Um, did you always know that you wanted to go to the bar and how was entering the bar similar to your expectations and also different to your expectations? Mm. Um, especially in the, the early period when you just get there and you're doing pupillage and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it became clear to me that I wanted to be, to be an advocate probably around first year of university. Hmm. And it's because myself and two other very nerdy friends <laughs> went to, would in like the December holidays, go to the constitutional court to go hear cases. Had no cooking clue what they were talking about. I mean, I remember hearing the word like paja, paja. and paya. And I had that exact word. What is paja? What's paya? Yeah, it's important. <laughs> yeah, paja. 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 <laughs> and then, they, you know, the advocates in the room would always be like referring if you go to like bundle XYZ. I'm like, where are these bundles? Why don't we have them? You know? Um, and I, I found that engagement with the court interesting because what I've seen advocates do is really get into the nub of the case mm. to... Mm. Because um, I enjoy the idea of the law and the and the philosophy behind the law. One thing law school always taught me is to ask the question why. And so rules don't merely exist for the sake of it. Why do they exist? What purpose do they fulfill? Sure. And you know, one of the things our constitution tries to do is to strike at rules that have no purpose, mm. right? Mm. If you're going to restrict people's liberties, there has to be a damn good reason why. And if you're unable to justify why those liberties have to be restricted, then that has to, in fact, be taken away. Mm. So that's a discipline certainly taught at the Witz Law School about asking mm. those kinds of questions. Mm. Mm. And it's certainly something that informs the way in which I practice law. I ask, okay, it exists, sure, yeah. but to what end? Do, do you remember any cases, by the way, just, just to go mm. back in the journey where you were first year that you watched that that left an impression on you or like a, a thing that happened in court yeah. that that made a mark on you? Yeah, it was the case, uh, case that in joint liaison committee versus um, MEC for education in case in. I remember the, the, there was an um, uh, Jason uh, Brickhill currently mm. runs uh, Seri today. Mm. Mm was uh, uh, the advocate who appeared on behalf of the amici in that case. And it, it, it was in that case where I you know, first heard words about Pacha and I was yeah. like, what the hell is Pacha? You know? <laughs> Who's Who the hell is Pacha? Like, what's the Pacha? I mean, I feel like I'm a law student. I should know what Pacha is. I had no idea what Pacha was. Mm. Um, so Jason argued to that case, and that case left a particular impression because mm. he was young, uh, it was his first appearance at the Constitutional Court. And I had formed a relationship through him to, through one of my uh, best friends, Tsepo Mosaka, who is now Dr. Tsepo Mosaka at UCT. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tsepo and, uh, Tsepo was uh, Jason's mentee and I had met Jason through that. But it was just the sheer, like, I mean, the Concord is an intimidating space. Yeah. If you're one man dealing with 11 judges, sure. and it's that one-on-one -on -one engagement. But it's just how he was able to stand his ground. Mm -hmm. but the one case that struck me, really, and I still remember that hearing to this day, is um, the match of South African Informal Traders for Forum versus City of Johannesburg. I was a in my third year at mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. Um, I had uh, been, I was an intern at uh, Seri. Yeah. And uh, I was, it was like in the November, December period. Stuart Wilson, who is now a judge, mm. was the executive director at the time. Yes, of course. And the, there was, a, the city of Joba came up with the, the, an operation called Operation Clean Sweep, mm. Mm. where in December they decided that any informal trader on the pavements of the streets of Johannesburg had to be moved wholesale and be placed in the business center that they had planned to build in the future. Now they implemented this project literally just before the December period, probably the busiest time, the time when people are lush with money and they're spending on their families, et cetera. Mm. But it's an important time for informal traders because that's really where you make you know, your buck. Sure. 
So they decided, you know, overnight we're going to do this. And so the JMPD was out on the streets removing people forcefully. Seru, which typically d does, you know, eviction and housing cases, took on this case. Mm. And they brought an urgent and I was assisting with research, etc. Mm. Uh, by then, at least I knew what Paja was, you know. <laughs> sure. You knew who uh, yeah, yeah, I knew who the hell Paja is now. And uh, they launched an urgent in the high court. Uh, and it got struck. The judge was like, this thing is not urgent. I'm not hearing it. There was just something very wrong about that. Again, that deep sense of injustice. How do you, in the face of what's happening, these are the facts that are put to you. No process, just a decision made overnight. Everybody must go. Mm. Um, uh, and the judge was like, no, it's not urgent. You know, the, despite the very real, uh, clear, eminent yeah, likelihood that this is going to have a huge impact on the livelihoods of informal traders. Especially, because, and there was this like a narrative that was ran that you know there are these people to be discarded and thrown to the side mm. when the informal traders market is a huge contributor to GDP. Mm. So anyway, so the judge strikes the application, and it was you know demoralizing to the whole team. What do we do next? And there was an internal debate. You know, you know, what do we do? Do we just enroll it in the ordinary course? But if we enroll it in the ordinary course, the impact of this would have materialized. The entire intention behind an urgent is. There's real harm happening right now, please assist. Mm, mm. So a decision was then made that uh, the application would go to the, the, there'd be an application to the Constitutional Court for direct access. Mm. Now, the Con Court almost never gives direct access. And it was a gamble to take a case for an interim relief mm, one, mm. which is, you know, as you know, at interim relief, you're just demonstrating probabilities. Um, and, you know, real prospects of success at a later stage. The case on interim relief, an urgent direct access application to the Concord. That is a big gamble. Yeah. But why not? So an application was lodged. You went to the Concord. The Concord set it down. Hmm. Now, usually they dismiss those pay applications on paper. Hmm. It's December. Hmm. <laughs> the Concord judges are usually aware it's recess at that time. Hmm. You yeah. Know? But they set it down somehow miraculously. Set it down. And then uh, the case was then enrolled, I think, literally a week later or something. Wow. The judges of the court convened. All of us went to the hearing. When I tell you I had never seen the Concord as alive as it was that day, hmm. Hmm. where there was a clear, where the judge had a clear sense of the injustice that was happening yeah. there. Hmm. Literally every one of them was on fire with questions. Hmm. Every single one. Hmm. I had clocked the Concord, had been to many Concord yeah, hearings. Sure. To this day, I've never seen the court that alive. Wow. Uh, to a case, to the facts, to, the, you know. And that case, I remember to this very day, hmm. um, yeah, just striking. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So those, you know, Jason's argument in first year, yeah. third year law school, I'm seeing this. And I think what was particularly striking about that case was there was a very immediate real impact after the hearing. I mean, the, the again, about the sense of injustice, it was very clear that the court gave an order that day, <laughs> which it never does. Wow. Uh, all 11 gave an order that day and they said, we'll give re reasons later. <laughs> so they gave an order given granting urgency, mm. granting direct access, mm. giving the interim relief. Wow. But seeing a very real direct impact that very day mm. on the, the ability of, I think at the time, Syria was representing over 1,000 informal traders. Uh, the fact that they could go back and trade, something so, mm. to many, very meager, being able to sell you know, bananas and apples, et cetera, mm. on the sides mm. of the street, but you've been allowed to do that by the highest court in the land. Yeah, and advocates assisted in doing that. Very, very clear uh, journey for me. So, yeah, it's a combination of that and the fact that I like talking. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's usually a, good, usually a good thing for an advocate. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel, become a member, or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books, 
All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. Uh, you go to the bar and you become Advocate Tembega Ngukai Torbi's final mentee yeah. or pupil as, as they used to or still or whatever. Um, but when you go to, when you become an advocate, you have to sit for a year at the feet of someone who's been doing it for a long time and learn the craft. You don't get paid yeah. and you just have to imbibe all of the knowledge that they pass on to you. Yeah. Um, tell us about that first year at the bar and also what it was like to serve under such a renowned figure. Yeah. Um, I think he became a senior counsel the year after, or, or so right. you were his final people. That's right, yeah. Um, what was that year like yeah. going to the bar and also being uh, the pupil of Advocate Guy Toby? Yeah. Sure, the bar was tough, eh, first year? Hmm. Um, so you mean Harvard was a, Harvard was a stroll? Uh, no, look, <laughs> I'll tell you, Harvard academically yeah. challenged me to the brim. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I, I say what I say about the U.S. and Harvard, but yeah. the, the sh like level, the standard, the stand in that classroom, yeah. exceptional, yeah, exceptional. Can imagine. And with the volume, with the yeah. just really exceptional, the best I've seen. That's so, the difference. It's like it's not it's not that everyone is super smart. It's just that the floor is so high that right. the standard is the top. Yeah, and you have no choice but to perform. Absolutely right. Yeah, and so. Mm. It was really the stark difference between, you know, my Witz Law School classroom, mm. where in some classes, you know, a lecturer was standing and just reading out sure. their written notes. Mm. And Harvard, which uses the Socratic method, mm. where, you know, as it's seen sometimes in TV, like movie, like uh, films, um, where there's a professor and, and they're just asking you questions, you know. And the the level of, oh man, it, it challenged me, I could you not. It, and also, Added to that is just, I was a guy who read every single case in law school. So I, I didn't read the summaries, etc. Yeah. I would read cover to cover because wow. I really felt like I could remember cases that were easier, yeah. but I could really engage with the meat of the cases uh, by reading cover to cover. Yeah. I tried to do that at Harvard. It was just not possible. Sure. Just the volume. It, the volume was crazy. So no, the level there was just exceptional. Yeah. Exceptional. Yeah. 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 But to, to yeah. So <laughs> pupillage was difficult. Mm. Um, it's difficult for financial reasons. You do not get paid for that entire year. Um, it, it is mentally challenging. And I remember one senior saying to me that you will never forget your year of pupillage. And that's very true. Mm. Um, you will, he at the time was 15 years at the bar and he still remembered his pupillage. You will never forget yeah. it because you're being challenged academically, you're being challenged mentally, you're being challenged financially. Sure. And through all of that, you must still, again, glide like a duck of mm. water. Mm. And so, um, the intensity wasn't so much in the in the academic work. Mm. So pupillage assumes you know the knowledge. Sure. So it's not you've done law school. Mm. Now take that knowledge and apply it, right? Mm. So how do you move? No, you know, no, now you know know about paja and motions and action proceedings and pleas, etc. That's all in the books, fine. Mm. How do you take that and actually, with the real life case, um, mm. demonstrate that? Mm. So. It was that challenging. The the because all throughout school, all of the does was, do you understand this as it yeah. as it's written in the books? Yeah. Um, um. Can you grapple with those principles? But now you have to apply them. So it was challenging from that perspective. Um. But it was also a lot of fun. Like, hmm. um. It is the one time in your probably post university or legal career where you can make silly mistakes. Where you can have like. Uh, you know, drunken, stupid nights with your, uh, you know, pupil classmates. Um, and it, it's fun in the sense that, you know, when you sometimes laugh at your own struggle, where you're like, yeah. you know, get a four out of 10 or three out of 10 for a legal writing exercise. Yeah. And everybody in the classroom also got three out of 10 or four out of 10. All of us laugh about it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there was a camaraderie about it, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so pupil is just tough, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but once you get, and it moves very quickly, I mean, you start in January, it's a full year, but by the time you get, I mean, it's January, in August, you're writing exams, in October, you start doing practicals, and then you're out in the world after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it really moves at a fast pace. And it, each day it feels like punches, but you still have to get up and fight. Um, with Tim Baker, sure. Um, mm. he, I had met him through Jason. Right, um, right. I, so I didn't... I didn't know him, I didn't know of him mm. until I had said to Jason, uh, probably in my fourth year now at yeah. university, yeah. hey, I'm thinking about going to do 
I've, I mean, I've thought about what I've seen what attorneys do, I've seen what advocates do, I really want to go to the bar. Hmm. Um, uh, is there a mentor that you would recommend? He's like, actually, yeah, there is someone. So at the time, Timbega was the director of litigation at, uh, Kel uh, not Kelts, uh, uh, Right. Uh, Charleston's uh, LRC. LRC, that's right. Yeah. So Leo Resource mm. Center. So he was a director of litigation there. And they had known each other from mm. there. Mm. So he's like, no, there's a guy I need to introduce you to. So Jason did an introduction over email to make us say, let's have coffee. We went mm. to have coffee. Mm. And we had a great time. I was like, okay, yeah, this is going to work. Yeah. Um, so I then left, went abroad. Um, so we, we, I had earmarked him, if you will. Yeah. So in 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 uh, fourth year, no, first year of uh, when I was talking for the con at the Concord, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go abroad. Mm -hmm. I'll be back at X Y Z time. Can we? St can I do pupillage with you in 2017? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, sure, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So. I come back again probably three, you know, three years later mm. and it's time to do uh, pupillage. So we had already, we had a relationship prior to that. So, um, and I sort of got a sense of, you know, what it is that we were, what it is that he expects, what he wants to do, etc. We had even tried writing a, a co-authoring a chapter in a book together, mm. but we ultimately did write something together and, and uh, uh, edited a book together. So there's a book out there, Public Interest litigation in South Africa um, hmm. that we were involved in. Um, uh, but in pupillage, sure. I mean, mm. Temega throws you in the deep end and he's like, swim. <laughs> so he, um, he is, he is incredibly generous with his advice, in, uh, incredibly generous with his time. Is there a piece of advice that he gave you that, that you remember to this day that like has stood you in good stead yeah. at the bar? Yeah. Let your work be your loudest advocate. Literally. Mm. Uh, he says there'll be lots of noise at the bar, mm. there'll be lots of politics at the bar and whatever, mm. but what people can never take away from you is the quality of your work mm. and what it is that you produce. Mm. Because that's besides politics, that's besides all of that. Absolutely. So let your work be allowed as advocate. He told me that the first day when we had coffee, actually. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's such an important lesson across yeah. disciplines and, and the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, because you can get so lost in the politics and the yeah. noise and this yeah. person said this about you and this person thinks you're great and this yeah. person thinks you're terrible and... The work is what matters in the work stands, your record stands as it is. And I, I remember asking him, you know, how has he gotten there? Yeah. You know, what were his, were there like particular secrets, etc. He's like, no, it's just, I let my work be my loudest advocate. And that's how I got here. Mm. Mm. And this was before the fame, right? Sure, so sure. this was before the fame happened for him when I was at Harvard. And it was, uh, I remember like the Zuma case that went to the Concord where everybody was asking, who's this guy? Mm. Like. Mm. Um, but what people don't see is the years of work sure. to get to that quality, to get mm. to that standard. Mm. Mm. Uh, people see the end result, but not the actual hard work. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the, the uh, pupillage with him was extraordinary. Um, Must have been. He, I mean, he, you know, uh, thank God for the for the famous years because when I you know, he was doing great work, but when I got there, it was really just yeah. almost like the constitutional court again. You know, really interesting cases. There was not a weekend I recall saying there was not a weekend where you open the Sunday paper and there was some political controversy hmm. that he was not somehow involved in mm. as a legal advisor of sorts. Wow. And so you felt very real impactful work hmm. um, that people were talking about. Hmm. So he throws you in the deep end, he expects you to swim um, and, uh, and, you, uh, and you just have to, you have to manage. So it was that. I am um, uh, just incredibly timed uh, and his advice um, and the work um, uh, Temeke really cares about output and so you have to swim yeah do you do you have any advice for those who are who are interested in the craft of advocacy we've actually spoken to him about mm. about this on the show we've spoken to a, a line of advocates actually yeah. um, you're you're quite deep into the bar now you know you're doing incredible work obviously what, what kind of things do you think that those coming into the profession in the future should bear in mind to, to let their work be the loudest advocate? Mm. Sure. Um, what I've often found to be, and you know, now the one is a little bit more senior at the bar, what I've yeah. found to be uh, a common problem is the almost, um, I don't, I want to say the probably flippant way in which people move through cases. Mm. 
there's the silent period before you argue a case where you just have, you sit in the stillness of a bit a day or two before and you really think about the arguments etc but that's it by then it's almost too late uh, because the papers are in it's settled etc mm. but if from jump you had really gotten into the niche of it like people think it's ridiculous that when i read my papers i read every single page in the brief mm. every single one mm. because you don't know what you might find on page 2001 oh my um and and when you've prepared your case with that rigor where you go line by line through everything mm. um uh, you are so much better for it mm. at the end mm. and so there's just you know the sort of patchwork um that one sometimes sees where you like miss out on an important detail that isn't there so i i, I guess i'd say care about the detail yeah 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 care it is as important as the big points care about the detail mm. which i yeah I've, you sort of see people through like run through it really yeah how, um, do, you, how do you do that when yeah. when the workload becomes yeah like with very little sleep <laughs> oh, no. with very little sleep yeah, yeah i mean and having it's, felt that like as you become more senior and the yeah. more responsibility um maybe you get quicker and more efficient yeah. or you know um, or not maybe yeah. it's just like hours yeah. it's a proverbial uh, problem that every advocate has mm. you know you take a you take a brief and you're like oh yeah i should have capacity for it yeah yeah uh, you know are you available xyz yeah I've, i'm available for that mm. and then uh, somehow something else that you committed to a while ago the deadline comes at the same time and there's something else the deadline comes at the same time mm. And it's a there's no magic to it. It's sure. if you ask any advocate, they'll say, okay, you know, you know, don't take on too much work because you know, and it's important. You have to show up with every brief because mm. what you find is you've only got a finite amount of time in a day. Yeah, you are better if you're spending a full day on one matter than you are on three matters in one day. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's a there's no magic to it. I I haven't come across anyone who's been able to magically deal with it. Mm. Mm. Um, because the difficulty with that is you're still expected to perform at that level despite the sheer volume of work absolutely yeah and i don't know if there's a yeah there's no magic trick i try my best to say no to work where i'm just like look you know it's it's not going to be possible mm. uh, i just don't have the time as interesting as that is i i, I can't yeah. Uh, but I still find myself trapped. I mean, just last week, uh, mm. the week to the ICJ, <laughs> phone is blowing up. <laughs> you just try. You try your best. Um, uh, there's really no magic to it. Yeah. Really, yeah. But I, it, it, you know, for me, it's just if you have to put in the hours, you have to care about the details. Mm. You really have to. Yeah. Let's talk about that that ICJ moment. Mm. Um, you know, we've we've gone through your journey. Of course, so far that's that's almost the culmination of you know everything that that went into your journey yeah never mind the concord and the 11 judges you're sitting before what was it 17 that day or oh, 17, 17 yeah. of yeah. the world's you know finest jurists at the international court of justice yeah. the country is watching the world is watching uh, you couldn't imagine a, a case of higher stakes yeah. um and I mean, how did you just, just tell us everything about that <laughs> like, but, but that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have seen, yeah. you know, um, how did you get involved in a case like that? And did it dawn on you when you became involved, how big that, that legal moment was going to be? Yeah, sure. Um, how I got involved was um, Tim Baker had insisted mm. um, that myself and Lagata had to be in the case. Wow. So the way in which it works is, you know, usually, you know, in a matter like that, government will approach for seniors sure. and the seniors get to pick their juniors. Right. right. Uh, and so that's how the two of us got involved. Mm. Um, um, you know, that's the other thing about uh, Tembeke is that he will be allowed as advocates in rooms that you are not in. Mm. I've heard it time and time again from people who, you know, CEOs of XYZ company will say, oh, yeah, he spoke about you. He mm. said one to three about you. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I'm immensely, immensely grateful to him. Um, I certainly would not be here without him at all. Mm. Mm. So that's how I got in. Um, mm. uh, I think he got a call from um, government. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not sure who exactly in government. And he said, yeah, these are the two juniors that I want. And that's how the two of us got involved. Mm. Um, it's December. Yeah. Everybody is... Um, winding down yeah. popping champagne and 
you know, uh, custard and jelly and <laughs> trifles and all of that. And we are working. I remember on on the 31st, my friend had a, a New Year's Eve party at his yeah. house. On the 31st of December, mm. I was on a call with Tembeke and Lagato, I think, until about 10 o'clock. Oh. I had my laptop with me. No. You know, here, be on the other side, but I'm, you know, working. Um, and so it just had to be that way. Uh, there was certainly, you know, yeah. One didn't have a full December and all of that fun stuff. Mm. Yeah, I'm still waiting for my break. Yeah, it's it's yeah. coming. I'm going to try and squeeze it in in some way. I don't know where. <laughs> so we it's 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 move and move very quickly. Um, <laughs> the cases. Uh, I mean, what was extraordinary about this is that I think the application went off on the 29th of mm. December. Mm. Either the se- that day or the day after, the court says, okay, great, come on the 11th and the 12th of January. <laughs> and so it's an urgent, obviously, but mm. I, said, I don't think any of us expected a response that quick. Yeah. And so that just cancelled your December plans where, where, you know, this thing is moving ahead. It's, it's the, I've never appeared before the International Court of Justice. So, um, I used to teach public international law at mm. this, but had never appeared before that court. Wow. And so... It's one thing to teach about the principles, use Kogans and law students would know Erg yeah. Omnes and all of that. Mm. Uh, and another to actually see it in, in practice. That's really the big leap between law school and, and practice as an advocate. So I'd never seen it, never, and importantly, never imagined being at that court. Yeah. Never imagined being at that court ever. Yeah. Um, and so when you get the call, it, you know, and I didn't get a call. It's essentially, how it happened was I was just put on a WhatsApp group. <laughs> Um, and and then the case is moving. Yeah, 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 no. Like, I wasn't asked are you accepting the brief or not. You know, I sort of put on a WhatsApp. Wow. <laughs> um, the form- formalities of briefs and all of that came after the fact. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. Um, Can yeah. I just ask one question about this? Like, the speed at which you had to put that case together, I think, is is one of the things that is underappreciated. Yeah. The the sheer amount of legal instruments that you would have had to go through, but also factual uh, material and I think probably more than any other publication let alone legal publication the way that the team was able to synthesize the case and distill it Mm. for for a simple understanding in all that complexity in such a short period of time is is nothing short of uh, you know an intellectual masterwork yeah. on behalf of the team yeah Look, there's a, how there's, the heck did you do that there's a there are uh, there's huge huge support um uh, there's three uh, researchers who've been mm. uh, i'd want to call i want to i'd want to mention it but i don't know if they want to be mentioned right okay were essential to mm. so it certainly wasn't a one-man effort they uh, uh, crazy 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 hours to mm. put it all together mm. um so that was you know immensely immensely helpful yeah um, um so yeah i mean even the, to this day if you you know turn on my phone i'm sure i probably have like 100 notifications now mm. where we're constantly um working the case mm. every single day without mm. fail um so yeah it's that without giving away much yeah, that's really sure. yeah enough. um but the yeah, so, you know, December happens, you know, we're preparing as frantically as we can for yeah. the, uh, and a lot is happening and moving at the same time. Mm. Um, there's, I mean, I remember just the sheer sense of gratitude mm. I had. Um, sure, when they say our ancestors' wildest dreams, yeah. I mean, the sheer sense of gratitude and the enormity of the case. Mm. Um by far the biggest case I've been involved in. Yeah, uh, I think you're going to have to go a long time, possibly, before you see something like that. Again. Yeah. Like any, any lawyer, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, it yeah. really is like just one of those like once in a lifetime mm. kinds of cases. Mm. Um, yeah, So, but, but which brings me actually to, the, to, to something that's concerned me, me. I mean, one of the things that Rato and I were talking about was mm. just how that international... Uh, legal practice in that court in other forests does not look like people like you and I. Mm, absolutely. It doesn't look like Lerato. It doesn't look like, you know, often what you find is that African states are either applicants in that court or respondents in that court, but they advocates are not. Mm. And so there's a strong uh, dominance of English lawyers in that space Sure. who won't say this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There'll be another case tomorrow mm. and another case tomorrow. Mm. 
Um, sure. In fact, I was listening to a, a podcast from a, a day or two ago where this academic had like analyzed, did empirical data research on the history of a court mm. and the appearances in that court. And in the period that he was assessing, I think from 1998 until 2011, mm. he said of the 98 uh, cases that were before the court, 80% of them were by non-OECD countries, mm. right? So not the West, not sure. the, yeah. And of that, the uh, number of um, black folks that had appeared mm. was less than 10%, hmm. which is a shocking number. Yeah. Because international law is not for the exclusive purview of English lawyers, mm. nor is it for the exclusive understanding of English lawyers. But it's particularly concerning because Advocates have a direct impact on the shaping of the law. Yeah. The kind of cases that are being argued, the principles that are being argued. Mm. Now imagine taking, you know, our principles from our constitution and infusing that into international law. Mm. But that's not possible if you, if you just know South Africans are appearing yeah. before that court. I think that's yeah. what was so powerful about that day and why it stirred even in people who thought they were long past patriotism, yeah. why it stirred something in them because it, it was our lawyers, yes, of course, uh, Professor Lowe was there and, um, and Nick Lennon, Lennon, and, yeah. uh, Casey was there. Yeah. Um, but it was our lawyers as well, yeah. demonstrating that not only was our case strong and moral, but it was expertly delivered. Mm -hmm. And we were not just as good as, but better. Mm. You don't need to say it, but like, <laughs> better, you know, than, than those on the other side who had written international law textbooks yeah. and, you know, some of whom had, had been there and, and were old hands in that court. Yeah. You know, there was something about going there as a South African team yeah. that was such a powerful statement. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think what it uh, was represented for us that is, is that it's possible mm. and uh, what, you know, we're some at so many, in the world. yeah, at some at so many levels, South Africans can perform and compete and be better. Yeah, that's what you saw in your Harvard class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. that. In in my academic experience, yeah. there's like this moment where you're like, hold on, I'm not worse than these people. I'm actually just, as good, if yeah, not better. Yeah. I just never knew because yeah. I could never compete against yeah. them. Yeah, and you're not missing anything. Right? Like it's not. And when you, sh you, you there's you know there's lots that's wrong about our country. Oh yeah. But um, Jesus, man, when we show up on a global stage, we really do. Mm. In, in so many spaces. I mean, this is shortly after like the Rugby World mm. Cup win, uh, our performance in the Cricket World Cup, mm. uh, and the netball, mm. and you know, it, it's just it wasn't. And now in law, yeah, <laughs> you know, someone had said was, the case was like the, Olymp the South African. I mean, the Olympics in the legal world, you know, <laughs> and South Africa, you know, won fifteen two, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it it just really dawned on me in that moment that mm. uh, Jesus. I mean, even in that, we we can come toe to toe yeah. with uh, what the, what the West, what the world call, calls uh, some of the best international lawyers. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, but that it can't end there, and I don't know what it is that I can individually do, mm. but it absolutely can't end there. Yeah. That it shouldn't be, oh, Tsuriso Lerato and all the others, mm. you know, appeared in this case and it happened once. Mm. There should be many more others, and it doesn't have to end with South Africans. There absolutely. are talented lawyers across the continent, many of whom I've met yeah. uh, in Namibia, in Lesotho, mm. in Nigeria, uh, who would do as well, if not better, uh, yeah. in those forums. So we just need to do, you know, do better with that. Yeah. Um, but I understood um, what it symbolized. Mm. Um, um, win or lose the case. Sure, sure. What it meant to young black South Africans, what it meant to young black lawyers um, that we were there. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and, and so it just really was just beyond ourselves and, you know, patting ourselves on the back or yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, I know we can't delve into the merits of the case, so we're going to steer away from that because it could well be with us for a very long time. Yeah. Um, what about the reaction to the judgment, though, on a personal level? Because yeah. I think there was such great tension in the country when we all felt as though we had delivered a really strong case yeah. that was also on the right side of the law and history. Yeah. But it was in the judge's hands from there. Yeah. And, and for them to come back so resoundingly, yeah. I mean, what did that mean to you and the team? Mm -hmm. And, you know, can you take us into like, 
just what the team was saying, like, how did you all respond when the court came yeah. out so strongly in, in your favor? Oof. I mean, it probably reminds me of the feeling in Gundwan, you know, and mm. uh, South African Informal Traders Forum, you know. Just like, whew, I don't know how it is. It's a different, it's a, it's a different euphoria. The case is not about us. Yeah, sure. It's not about the lawyers. It's not about South Africa. Mm. It's about the suffering Palestinians. And, and unfortunately, the sheer silence of the world to that. Mm. Uh, we, I mean, it was just an excessive jubilance. Mm. Um, um, uh, there are some members of the team who might have shared a tear or two. I won't disclose who. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but it was just sheer, sheer jubilance yeah. because say what you want about the law, it can do that. Mm. Mm. Uh, it can recognize suffering and sometimes bring an end to suffering. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that as lawyers, as advocates, we get a, we play a, a small part in, in doing that. Uh, and that's really what's so um, great about the work. It's, 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 uh, there's an, oh, you touch something and there's almost an immediate impact. Yeah. And I don't know of anything out there that has, for me personally, that has that same sort of impact. An impact that it's not just, you know, you know wealth accumulation, how much money do you have, sure. all of that. Sure. But it's thousands of people at the same time, mm. uh, be, you know, because of, you know, things written in, in a book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah, it was, everybody was, I mean, and we were all in different parts of the world. You know, mm. um, uh, and then I think we we convened that night. We had a as you know a Zoom call, just be like, "Wow, hey guys, did that just happen? Yeah, did that just happen? Yeah. You know, yeah." Um, and of course, shortly after those celebrations, the next question, okay, next step. So what are we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 can you just uh, typical of lawyers? Yeah, like okay, well done. Yeah. Have your glass of champagne. Let's move. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Yeah. I guess to to end off, and and hopefully you know down the years we'll be able to have more of these conversations, but. We've been having, you know, a long running set of conversations on this channel with Advocate Mukai Tobi, Kakane, many, many others um, about the constitution and South Africa's constitution. And I think there's there's a real need in this particular moment in our country's history to, to look at the constitution in a clear eyed way, but also potentially to avoid any of the extremes on mm. either side of that debate, which which really cloud whether the constitution is either this perfect document that is holy writ or is the worst thing that's ever existed and the cause of all of our injustice and inequality. Yeah. You know, um, what is your view on the transformative potential of the South African constitution? Are you, are you skeptical about it or are you optimistic about it mm. and, and why? And how do you grapple with the text's place in our society right now? Mm. You know, I think the constitution has done what it can. Um, it has set ambitious goals about what we can as a society achieve, yeah. what each of us are entitled to. Um, uh, which some, in fact, what's funny about this debate that's happening probably over the last year or two is it's the same debate that was had as the constitution was being drafted. Mm. Like, are these not two lofty goals? Like, mm. can you really meet up to all of these dreams? And the constitution is an empty shell in the absence of action. Um, and so the constitution can't do more than make those particular promises mm. that we, the people, say this is a reflection of our society. I think in the absence of, of clear political action, it will remain an empty vessel. And so I don't think it as a thing, as a document, can do more. It's much like people will say, you know, um, uh, the XYZ person has broken the law. How do we fix that? Oh, we just change the law, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no amount of more legal action, more judgments sure. that can fundamentally change South African society in the absence of political action. Mm. Literally nothing can be done. Mm. And um, we see it in cases often. You get a massive victory, everybody is happy, mm. and then very little happens after that. That's not the failure of the law or the failure of the constitution. It's the implementers of it that are to be held accountable. Mm. So I'm not sure if there's anything more that can be done other than that. It would be a different conversation altogether. People were saying, we think the goal on, uh, as we're seeing now the debate about section 25, sure. um, that perhaps 25-1, which freezes and protects property rights as mm. they existed at the time, mm. um, 
is a, is it requires amending, uh, given the vast inequalities in our country. Yeah. But it's also inherently contradictory in the sense that in twenty five eight and twenty five nine it says you know. Or rather, 25 two going down sets out the steps that government must take to give effect to 25. Yeah. But then in 28, it says nothing in this provision stops government from taking those progressive measures, mm. right? Mm. Including 25 one that freezes property rights. Sure. Um, but it can say that, and you can amend it tomorrow, right? You can pass an amendment tomorrow saying sure. there are no property protections. Everything must be uh, given over to the state, and it must start distributing that. Mm. The document can say that, but it will be dead words, empty words in the absence of those actions. Mm. So you can amend it until you turn blue. Yeah, it's not going to change much in the absence of mm. political action. Mm. So I, I, I've, I've often found the debate about it to be, to be not what is the instruments of the constitution that prevent you from doing that work. Yeah. It's that there's been absence of action and we think it's the constitution's fault. Mm. Um, and I've never seen uh, certainly the connection between the two arguments. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when it says, for instance, you know, everybody has a right to a basic education, it said it. Um, uh, how will amending that change it? Unless what you're saying is the goal in the text itself is not one that we identify with anymore, which is why the 25 debate is relevant. Mm. Uh, but outside of that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's just my view. Yeah. And it is a document which is capable of also undergoing metamorphosis itself. Yeah. So I suppose in, in challenging the constitution, one also has to appreciate that the text as it is at any given time is not fixed no. into the future. Yeah. There are ways of evolving the text. Yeah. That for me is the, is the interesting conversation, yeah. is between like it's the worst thing in the world and it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. In what ways should it be mutating or evolving now, um, you know, to, to meet a new era? And it has changed in the past. Yeah. Um, it will change in the yeah. future, I guess. Yeah. No, I mean, one has to accept that it is a document that will change. Um, you know, uh, there's some constitutional law scholars who say the constitution is a reflection, reflection rather of society's conscience, right? Mm -hmm. And if those goals particularly shift, then amend. I mean, it, it expressly says you can, I want these goals, but you can amend me if you're unhappy about it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's in the text. When I think the debate has been missing is identifying what in the text is a problem mm -hmm. and is not a true reflection of what of who we are as a society. Um, one and two, is there a separation between the absence of political action yeah. uh, and measures taken to eradicate inequality and what the constitution in fact aspires to? Mm. And it's an interesting dichotomy because you often find judges almost forced in cases to be activists in their role beyond what we imagine judges to be able to do. Mm. Where you know, I recall when the Con Court, for instance, first gave out a, um, a supervisory order. You know, I mean, we remember for, it wasn't the first case, but we the most recent example is the Sasa one. Mm. It's a, you know, report back on X Y Z. Tell us, judges shouldn't be doing that mm. if our political systems were working, mm. where a judge has to monitor your compliance with constitutional obligations. Yeah, uh, and say, you know, you haven't met this, you haven't met that. Um, uh, and in other cases where, you know, judges have been accused of, for instance, you know, breaching the separation of powers mm. um, in order to get to a... And uh, I remember the judgment of the Con Court, I think it was, was it Mashango? I, I stand to be corrected, but there's a judgment of the Con Court. Mm. I remember Cameron wrote those particular paragraphs uh, in the judgment itself. Uh, and he says, you know, where the separation of power stands in the way of us dealing with an injustice that is naked and pure to, and clear to everybody. It cannot stand, mm. judges cannot be barred by the separation of powers mm. uh, from, from dealing with in, in suffering and injustice. Mm. And if that's, if separation of powers stands in the way, then the constitution demands better mm. and it demands more. Mm. Uh, because if there has to be a conflict between what the separation of powers demands and what judges can do and what the constitution demands, then so be it. Uh, for separation of powers, really, that's what Jack Cameron was saying there. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's. I think of course it can be amended, um, uh, but what is it about it that requires amending, that is uh, absent from from what's happening today, and how much of that is the absence of political action? Yeah. Well, Tsiriso Ramokhale, yeah. 
SC soon to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us on SNWX and we look forward to watching your career continue to unfold and all the best for the future, not to mention that ICJ case. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Spread the fire. <laughs> <laughs>